Hey guys, in this video, I want to talk about guns, and in particular, gun control, especially with the recent events happening around us, school shootings, mass shootings, people using guns, and what we see in media doesn't exactly show guns in a very positive light. In fact, guns are seen as evil or tools of destruction and no good in them. So, first and foremost, when these events occur, when there's a shooting, like, who exactly is to blame? Whose fault is it? Now, no one likes pointing the finger at anyone, but in this case, is it really the gun's fault? Is it someone else's fault? Or is there something deeper to it? So one thing I wanted to share, let's take this step by step, point by point. Number one, let's take a look at the Columbine High School shooting back in 1999. Daryl Scott, the father of Rachel Scott, a victim of the Columbine High School shootings in Littleton, Colorado. He was invited to address Congress. So what he said was pretty, pretty interesting, pretty insightful. And it goes a little like this. In the days that followed the Columbine tragedy, I was amazed at how quickly fingers began to be pointed at groups such as the NRA. The NRA or the National Rifle Association in the US supports the Second Amendment or the right to keep and bear arms. So he said, I am not a member of the NRA. I am not a hunter. I do not even own a gun. I am not here to represent or defend the NRA because I don't believe that they are responsible for my daughter's death. Therefore, I don't believe that they need to be defended. If I believe that they had anything to do with Rachel's murder, I would be their strongest opponent. I am here today to declare that Columbine was not just a tragedy. It was a spiritual event that should be forcing us to look at where the real blame lies. Much of the blame lies here in this room. Much of the blame lies behind the pointing fingers of the accusers themselves. Another account, Susanna Gracia Hub. Another shooting occurred back on October 16, 1991. I didn't grow up in a house with guns. I don't hunt, I personally abhor hunting, but I was given a gun by a friend when I was 21 to carry in my purse for self-defense and I was taught how to use it. A couple of years ago, my parents and I went to a cafeteria in Texas on a bright sunny day. We weren't in a dark alley where we weren't supposed to be. And as you all know the story, this madman drove his truck through the window and he began shooting. Well, immediately, my father and I got down on the floor and put the table up in front of us. And this guy kept shooting. And you're thinking, what, you know, what could it be? Is it, is it a robbery? That's the first thing that generally comes to mind. And he keeps shooting. It took me a good 45 seconds to realize that this man wasn't there to commit a robbery. He wasn't there for a hit. He was there to simply shoot as many people as he possibly could. Now, I'd like to make something clear. I hear all this talk about how many bullets can go in a clip. I've been there. I can tell you it doesn't matter. It takes one second to switch out a clip. You can have one bullet or a hundred bullets. It doesn't matter, guys. I've been there. He goes, dump, dump, just like that. That's not enough time to rush a man. I promise you. When I finally realized what was occurring, I thought, I got him. And I reached for my purse. He was maybe 12 feet away. 
You know, is it possible my gun could have jammed? Sure. Is it possible I could have missed? Sure. But I can tell you I've hit much smaller targets at much greater distances. But then I realized that a couple of months earlier I had made the stupidest decision of my life. I took my gun out of my purse and left it in my car. Because as you well know, in the state of Texas, it's sometimes a felony offense to carry a gun in your purse. I can tell you that I'm not mad at the guy that did this. As he continued, it was obvious that he was a madman. My father, at that point said, I'm gonna, I, I've got to do something, I've got to do something. He's going to kill everybody in here. And he rushed the man. No way. This guy turned, shot him in the chest. He went down, uh, was obviously mortally wounded. For whatever reason, that made the man change directions and go off to my left. Shortly thereafter, someone at the back of the restaurant broke out a window. When I saw what looked like an opportunity to escape, I turned around and I grabbed my mother by the shirt. And I said, come on, come on, we've got to run, we've got to get out of here. And then my feet grew wings, and I was out the back window. As soon as I got out, I realized that my mother had not followed me out. And as I learned from the police officers, she had crawled over to where my father was and cradled him until the guy got back around her, put the gun to her head. She looked up at him, put her head down, and he pulled the trigger. My parents had just had their 47th wedding anniversary. She wasn't going anywhere. As I mentioned, I'm not really mad at the guy that did this. And I'm certainly not mad at the guns that did this. They didn't walk in there by themselves and pull their own triggers. The guy that did it was a, a, a lunatic. That's like being mad at a, a rabid dog. I'm mad at my legislators for legislating me out of the right to protect myself and my family. I would much rather be sitting in jail with a felony offense on my head and have my parents alive. Now, in current events, recent shootings, December 14, 2012, Sandy Hook School, Connecticut, another shooting occurred. Now, my heartfelt condolences go out to the families of these children. It was in a high school. Around 20 children as young as six and seven years old First graders were shot dead, they were murdered, along with six adults, including the principal, teachers, and other, and the mother of the shooter. So the media portrays guns as a problem. They're seen as evil. But what the media didn't tell you in the news is, was certain information that would help us understand even further the situation, what really happened. Number one, the gunman, Adam Lanza, 20 years old, was actually mentally ill. According to sources, his elder brother, Ryan, and his high school, the gunman had Asperger's syndrome. Now, Asperger's syndrome is not normally linked to violent behavior. It's a pervasive developmental disorder that involves delays in the development of many basic skills, notably the ability to socialize with others, to communicate, and to use imagination. It is similar in some ways to autism. Now, many children with Asperger's syndrome are exceptionally talented or skilled in a particular area, such as music or math. Well, I want to take note also that, well, in the quote of, in the words of Peter Bell, Executive Vice President of Programs and Services at Autism Speaks, Autism did not cause this horrific event. There's a big difference between aggression and planned violence. Planned violence, which is what happened in this case. So we are not pinpointing the reason to a mental condition. It really lies down in the person and the person's intentions. So 
let's take a look at how it started. Adam Lanza, the shooter, the gunman, he lived with his mother. His mother was very worried of his mental state and extremely protective of him. His mother, Nancy, was reportedly an avid gun collector and she took her son's shooting. She was passionate about guns and it is apparent in her ownership of firearms. Now, Adam Lanza's killing spree actually started at home. There have been reports of Adam trying to buy a gun. He attempted to buy a gun before the attack. Now, the gun laws actually prohibited him from doing so when he tried to purchase a gun. However, he encountered that there was a background check. Now, he didn't want to wait and he didn't want to go through that. So what he did was he went back home and he used his mother's guns. He shot his mother in the face, killing her, before driving to Sandy Hook School in her car. He used his mother's well, uh, fire. He used his mother's firearms, a 223 rifle or a Bushmaster AR-15, which is essentially a civilian version of the M16 military rifle perfectly legal and he also used two handguns a Glock and a Sig Sauer these were illegally purchased by his mother however they were illegally acquired by the gunman and last I I remember murder and stealing of firearms are criminal offenses this did not stop him so he went on over to the school and this is how it ended. After over 100 shots fired, 10 minutes into the shooting after it all started, he heard police closing in. He shot himself using one of the handguns. Now, in typical actor active shooter scenarios, this has also occurred in several other instances around. And it usually ends with the first sign of armed resistance, in this case, when the police came in. Active shooters, like these people, come in armed to a school, a cinema, a gun-free zone, or any place. And once they, are, once they do encounter armed resistance, if they do not get shot or stopped, they usually end up turning on themselves and they use the gun and take their own life. Now it's sad that it took 10 minutes, over 20 lives, just for it to end. If it only ended sooner, probably things would have turned out way better. So this is the other side of the story. A little insight, which I saw on the Sandy Hook shooting, you want to know why? This may sound cynical, but here's why. It's because of the way the media reports it. Flip on the news and watch how we treat the Batman theater shooter and the Oregon mall shooter like celebrities. Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris are household names, but do you know the name of a single victim of Columbine? Disturbed people who would otherwise just off themselves in their basements. See the news and want to top it by doing something worse and going out in a memorable way. Why a grade school? Why children? Because he'll be remembered as a horrible monster instead of a sad nobody. CNN's article says that if the body count holds up, this will rank as the second deadliest shooting behind Virginia Tech, as if statistics somehow make one shooting worse than another. Then they post a video interview of third graders for all the details of what they saw and heard while the shootings were happening. Fox News has plastered the killer's face on all the reports for hours. 
Any articles or news stories here that focus on the victims and ignore the killer's identity? None that I've seen yet. Because they don't sell. So congratulations, sensational media. You just lit the fire for someone to top this and knock off a daycare center or a maternity ward next. You can help by forgetting you ever read this man's name and remembering the name of at least one victim. You can help by donating to mental health research instead of pointing to gun control as the problem. You can help by turning off the news. Samuel L. Jackson said this about the Sandy Hook shooting. I don't think it's about more gun control. I grew up in the South with guns everywhere and we never shot anyone. This shooting is about people who aren't taught the value of life. Now there's a popular perception and myth about guns and it goes like this. Gun control reduces crime. If you look at the recorded statistics, violent crime actually goes up when guns are banned. Take a look at the Washington DC case, among others. It's because guns can also save lives. A gun ban only applies to responsible, law-abiding citizens. Criminals do not follow the law. They will find a way to get a gun illegally. If a person has evil or ill intentions, that person will find a different tool or a way to do it. This does not make sense. Why punish responsible law-abiding gun owners? The only people who will benefit from a gun ban are the criminals. There is no single record of gun regulation that reduced violent crime or murder. Guns have become popular in many applications. Recreation, family bonding and heritage, practical competitive shooting, Olympic shooting, hunting, predator or pest control, self-defense. So, why guns? Well, I'd like to emphasize the meaning of the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment, contained in the Bill of Rights of the United States Constitution, states, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So this pretty much states the right of people to protect themselves, whether it be from danger, from tyranny, from oppression. And Susanna Gracia Hub, actually a victim of a shooting and was able to live to tell the tale, explains the meaning of the Second Amendment. She says, Just one final statement. I'm, I've been sitting here getting more and more fed up with all of this talk about these pieces of machinery having no legitimate sporting purpose, no legitimate hunting purpose. People, that is not the point of the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment is not about duck hunting. It's not about IPSC or IPSC shooting, or Olympic shooting, or any other type of practical or competitive shooting. And I know I'm not going to make very many friends saying this, but it's about our right, all of our right, to be able to protect ourselves from all of you guys up there. So in closing, instead of focusing on the problem, why don't we focus on something positive? Why don't we focus on a real solution? We know that guns are inanimate objects. They have no will of their own. They are just a tool 
And there are many dangerous tools out there in this world. A car, a knife, a screwdriver, a chainsaw, an ice pick, even a baseball bat, which happens to be, according to the FBI, the number one weapon used in violent crime in a study on deaths per year from selected causes. A baseball bat. So why don't we ban baseball bats? Why don't we ban cars? Why don't we ban knives? We know that nothing, that won't do any good. Nothing good will happen from banning those things. We know that a person is capable of doing good things. We know that a person is capable of doing bad things. We know that there are evil people in this world. It's a reality. We have seen it in the news. We see it around us. Some have experienced it firsthand. But what can we do? For me, I see we should just stop blaming. What good will that do? Why don't we focus on the people, focus on ourselves, on value systems, focus on being prepared in the event that it might happen again. Focus on setting a good example so that others can learn from it from us. I saw a comment on YouTube from a user in the UK and it made me realize something about gun control. He says, I'm from London, England. The highest level of gun control in the world is where I live. By the age of 17, I was robbed at gunpoint twice and the UK is the stab capital of this side of the continent, excluding Africa, Russia, and Asia. Although I believe there is no higher knife crime in Asia than in the UK. Guns are out of the hands of law-abiding people due to the laws. But a criminal, by definition, has no regard for the law. Therefore, they are armed. But I, as a law-abiding citizen, I'm not. If you do research on gun control case studies, the UK, the US, Australia, Jamaica, this is what happens when there is gun control. If you look hard enough, you'll see that gun control isn't about guns. It's about control over the people. It prevents good people from being able to protect themselves and the lives of others. While out there in this world, bad people continue doing harm to others. Now the world is not perfect. And there are people who have set bad examples. People have lost trust in others. But I think it's about time that people see both sides of the story. And instead of fear, mistrust, or lack of understanding of what the gun is and what the gun is capable of, I invite you to get to know responsible gun owners out there. Come shoot with me one time. If it's your first time, I'd gladly show you the basics. And if you think guns aren't for you, it's alright. There's no problem with that. No one is forcing you. I hope this video gave you some perspective on guns, gun control, people have used guns in bad ways, people have used guns in good ways. If there's anything you don't agree with, feel free to voice out your opinions, feel free to correct me.